Hello, everybody. Good evening. Can you all hear me? One second. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. I just. Good evening, sir. Yeah. How are you doing? Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, this is the start of our two day camp, the final seminar for 2022 O level history revision in English medium, right? So, this class is so special. I have named this class as the class of kings because of a reason. Uh, and for the past one and a half uh, years, we have been working hard in this class up to this uh, level, Pute. So yesterday also we had a we had a, a practice exam. Uh, we will be discussing the answers to that uh, tomorrow. So this is a two day camp. Let me tell you the plan slowly. Uh, and uh, today we have planned from four o'clock to ten o'clock. That's the original plan. Maybe it might go up to midnight. You never know because I have a target today. Okay, I want to complete that. Right, I want to achieve that target. Right, so that is why. Um, the time might differ, right? We will give breaks in between, so don't worry. Every hour, we're going to get a short break. I, I, I believe in productivity, so that's how it's going to work. Tomorrow, we're going to discuss the target paper in full, and I'm going to get you to answer uh, many questions, especially essay questions as well. We have a separate group for this to upload your work, so I will post the link to that group tonight, okay? Uh, because we have uh, uh, students who joined for this seminar only. I have invited all students who uh, only even only joined our seminar knowing about this class last moment. Uh, then I have added you in the regular group as well, which was functioning since the beginning of this class. So since you have only 10 days left, less than 10 days basically for your exam and exactly uh, 11th day, uh, from today, you're going to have your history paper, right? 31st of May. Um, only 11 days, less than 11 days left for your history paper, right? So this is the best time to have a final seminar because our students are very good in forgetting everything. So I thought like to push the final seminar towards the last part of the um, month because hopefully we can do classes until uh, 25th or 26th, right? I don't know exactly. The government will uh, decide that. Normally, um, by 22nd, they will ask us to stop. But I see the government allowing uh, classes to happen until next Friday. This is what I see. This is based on my experience. Still, we haven't received any uh, official announcement from the government. So we are good to go anyway because we are going to finish the seminar tomorrow, right? 21st is tomorrow. So if the government said 22nd, no problem. We are ready for this. And also uh, stay alert in the group because I will be sharing more thoughts more tips and tricks and stuff uh, that I expect uh, to come this year uh, in the group throughout the next week before your exam. So always keep an eye on the group, right? Uh, if you have any questions uh, when the seminar is going on, you can raise your hand. You can um, you can send me a text message through Zoom or you can send me a, a message through WhatsApp. I will be checking all those when the seminar is going on, right? Uh, and um, certain questions I won't be able to answer because if they are if they are a little off topic, so I will take that up uh, at the end of each session uh, before we go on to a break, right? So that's the plan. Okay. So before I start, I want to tell you that there are two types of students in this country. Okay, especially when it comes to history, right? The <laughs> The students, the, the regular students who are learning history and the special students who are basically part of the class of kings, right? Basically this class. So we basically get you to think and uh, develop your brains so that you are able to work on your own. Not only history, for the past one and a half years, we have been basically giving you light. We have been giving you insights into life. We have been giving you much, much more than history, right? So that's what makes this class special. So our students basically stand out from the rest. You know how to identify a student of mine. When you go to the exam hall, Bude, 
if he sees the history paper if he smiles at the paper okay if you see any student who will get the paper and look at the questions of the paper and if you see like somebody smiling at the paper that's how to identify my students okay that is how to know that this guy is a student of sheriff sir's class right because the confidence the level of confidence that we give you in this class is going to be next level okay basically we the approach that we take to studying history and everything that we learn in this class basically is the next level and when you see the questions in the exam you're going to laugh at the paper when everybody else is scratching their heads and thinking what to do you will be laughing at your paper and starting to answer because you already have done it in the class okay so that's the beauty of this class i guarantee you that right so um let's get started okay so today's plan today uh, i'm going to quickly go through the first five lessons of grade 10 first right uh, first first four lessons of grade 10 before we go on to a break so that's the initial plan today right traditional method is discussing a tilt in the seminar i don't want that right that's not going to work because you know uh, you go to seminars right these days you are going to seminars maybe you have gone to so many seminars for the past couple of weeks the traditional way is discussing a tilt is not going to help especially for history okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going <clears> to <throat> through sketches and through small notes i'm going to summarize all these lessons into single pages okay so then i'm going to give you time at the end of the session to take note of that like through screenshots you can save the screenshots and take notes later okay uh, so listen to this don't take any notes while the lesson is going on so listen to the lesson Just try to absorb everything that we tell once you inject those theories, the concepts into your head, no matter whatever the question they give, whether you have target questions or not, whether you have practiced them or not, you will be able to answer any type of question when you really have the theory in your head, right? So we can't discuss the whole syllabus in six hours. Let's be practical here. But I have identified very important areas of each and every topic. So I'll be summarizing using all those things into one little page uh, based on every unit, okay? so. Literally, it's going to be 18 pages worth of a short note that we are going to discuss today. Okay. So, without further ado, let's start the session today. And hopefully, by 10 o'clock tonight or 10 or 12, whatever, 10 o'clock, we have our exam. Okay. I can postpone that to 12 o'clock if you are willing to take up the challenge. It doesn't matter. We already, like more than 45 students, already took the exam yesterday. So, maybe a couple of students remaining now. So, if they want to take the exam, doesn't matter. Otherwise, I can open it tomorrow morning. Also, doesn't matter. But this seminar is more important, right? Uh, it might go until 11 o'clock. I don't know. Uh, I'm not a soothsayer, right? I, I just don't know uh, what the future is there, right? I mean, basically, you know, when I start explaining, I don't know, maybe I have to explain a few additional stuff. So, you can't really target like that. So that's why I ten table. I'm telling you ten to eleven o'clock. So we'll have our breaks in between. But let's try to summarize everything, right? Okay. So that's the plan for today. Uh, any questions before we start? Any questions? I'll take it as a no. Okay. So I'm going to mute you guys because accidental uh, switching on of mics might distract our students. Our students who are very focused, you know, on studies, you know, they, the slightest distraction, you know, uh, of our students might lead to disasters. So I just don't want that to happen. Okay. Right. <laughs> right. Um, okay. <laughs> Overstimulation, yeah, as we call it. Uh, we are recording this today, as you can see, this is on YouTube Live, okay? Uh, YouTube Live in the sense, it's not displayed to, uh, to the whole country. It is live in a sense that only the guys with the link can view this, right? So, um, but for the first hour of the um, seminar, I'm planning to release it later, right? So that somebody might benefit it. Maybe there are seven more days, so somebody can benefit from that. First hour only. Uh, everything else will be exclusive for our students only who are paying here, who have worked hard, whose mothers, fathers, they're working hard and they have been paying fees with great difficulty for the past couple of years. I know uh, 
because of the situation in the country and everything so we need to appreciate the efforts so this i'm also putting in a lot of effort right i also didn't fall from the sky so i'm 36 years old and i have passed so many exams and come here so i have worked day and night to come here and to be able to teach you history like this right so i also deserve something for my efforts right so end of the day it's it's um it's the month of Vesak, but uh, we have to make a living as well, right? So that's how it is. Okay. Um, let's get started with it. Grade 10, lesson number one, right? Sources of studying history. You know, the first lesson of grade 10 is about how to study history or what we can use to study history, right? So in order to study history, history is basically the study of the past, right? And history is the written past. If something is not written, that's not history. Okay. History is the written past. So the study about the past, the study about human actions and stuff that the events that happened in the past, we can call it history, right? Uh, that is written. Okay. Anything that is not written, we can't call it history. So when it comes to history, before we learn history, we need to know how to learn history. Okay, so there are two ways or there are two sources we can use to learn history. They are called sources. Now, sources means not cups and sources, not flying sources. These sources are basically stuff that can give information. Okay, like uh, it can be a book, it can be a thing. They can give you information about history. So we call them historical sources okay or sources of history so sources of studying history we have mainly two types we have two types of studying history sources of studying history the first one is called literary sources The second one is called the archaeological sources. Literary sources mean pute books that are written. So written sources means literary sources. Okay. Archaeological sources means things that are coming from the past, evidence in the form of different things other than books. They are called archaeological sources. Now, literary sources, we have two types. We have basically literary sources means books. Okay. We have books that are written in Sri Lanka. We are talking about Sri Lankan history. We have books written by foreigners about Sri Lanka. So we can use both type of books to study history. Okay. We can either use a book that is written in Sri Lanka or we can get a book someone else wrote about Sri Lanka from another country. Okay. Or someone who visited Sri Lanka and wrote about our country. So we can get that. So both sources of information, very important. Uh, literary sources and archaeological sources are the two types of sources to study history. Okay. So when it comes to literary sources, I told you there are local sources and there are foreign sources. Local sources are books that are written in Sri Lanka. Foreign sources are books that are written by foreigners who either came to Sri Lanka or didn't come to Sri Lanka. Okay. So let me just categorize it further. Okay. So we have foreign sources. There are two types of foreign sources as well. One is those who came to Sri Lanka. The other one is didn't come to Sri Lanka. There are people foreigners who came to Sri Lanka, saw the country from themselves, from, from their own eyes and wrote about Sri Lanka. There are also foreigners who wrote about Sri Lanka by listening to the stories from people who vi visited Sri Lanka. They never saw Sri Lanka, but they heard about Sri Lanka and wrote about Sri Lanka. Okay. And when it comes to the local sources, there are many types of books that are written locally. Okay, we uh, so that we can use them to study history. There are chronicles. Examples are Mahavansha and Divansha. Chronicles means 
they are basically books that contain historical information in order in order from the beginning what happened what happened is like a diary okay what happened today what happened tomorrow what happened uh, when this king ruled what happened after that what happened who ruled after that who ruled after that who ruled after that like that right so if if a book that if a book contains continuous information about history we call it a chronicle okay and in a chronicle you see everything arranged in a timely order what happened first will be in the first page what happened last will be in the last page not what happened first will be in the last page and what happened uh, later will be in the somewhere in the middle it's like you know like um, you know malaya charu yeah everything is there you don't know what you are eating basically you know everything is mixed up right basically you put everything together and then mix it up and eat it. you don't know whether it's a piece of onion or whether it's a piece of uh, date or whatever right it's not like that this is everything is arranged in a proper order those type of books we call them chronicles mahavansha and deepavansha are uh, the main two chronicles that we are talking about right deepavansha is the oldest chronicle mahavansha is the most trustworthy chronicle okay so why mahavansha is trustworthy because it was written by mahanama thera who is a scholar who did a lot of research about the shortcomings of deepavansha not only that many information in mahavansha can be proven using other sources like inscriptions we'll come to that later okay so that's local uh, sources chronicles for you other than that we have buddhist religious texts we have sandesha kavyas okay uh, we have prashasti kavyas we have different types of books to study the history of sri lanka which were written locally we call them local literary sources okay in short right if you want more information please read our tutorial um it's very easy to understand If within a few minutes you will be getting the full idea okay then uh, foreign sources we have people who came to sri lanka who saw sri lanka and wrote about sri lanka we have people who didn't come to sri lanka and who wrote about sri lanka by listening to the stories from the others who visited sri lanka very prominent sources written by foreigners who came to sri lanka we have uh the fahian thero's accounts about sri lanka fahian thero came to sri lanka to study about buddhism he came to sri lanka spent some time in sri lanka and wrote about sri lanka fahian thero was from china then we have an arab source that is ibn batuta's traveling accounts ibn batuta from arabia came to sri lanka during gampola kingdom visited many places in sri lanka wrote many things about sri lanka so we have clear evidence for this then we have robert knox who is an english national from england who came to sri lanka accidentally landed in sri lanka was taken prisoner spent 19 years in sri lanka while his way back home he wrote about sri lanka right so all these are basically experiences from their own uh, life right and there are also foreign sources written by people who never saw sri lanka one example is Suan Sang Thero's accounts, right? He is also from China, but he visited India. He visited India. He met with people who visited Sri Lanka. He listened to the stories of those people and wrote about Sri Lanka. Suan Sang Thero. Okay. Then uh, Ptolemy, Claudius Ptolemy, who lived in uh, the Roman civilization, the Roman Empire, back in Alexandria in Egypt, like more than two thousand years ago, he drew a map of Sri Lanka. without even setting a foot on sri lanka right you can see this map you can see, you can't see his map but you can see his photo in uh, page number 4 of your book right and not only that we have many other sources over here in page number 4 in your book you can see a table full of information about sources written by foreigners who never came to sri lanka right so this is the sketch that you must be drawing and you fill up the information based on the tutes and based on the information in the book when you get time right this is how you're going to remember everything at a glance okay don't forget mahavansha don't forget deepavansha they are important deepavansha is the oldest chronicle mahavansha is the most trustworthy chronicle okay and mahavansha has two parts mahavansha and chulavansha the first part of mahavansha is called mahavansha the second part of mahavansha is called chulavansha maha means great 
Vanshe is chronicle. So the great chronicle, if you translate Mahavanshe to English, is going to come as great chronicle. Uh, Chula Vanshe, you can say it's a little chronicle. Chula Vanshe is the second part of Mahavanshe. Okay. So the first part of Mahavanshe was written by Mahanama Thero in the 5th century. Okay. That is more than 1500 years ago. Okay. And uh, also to understand the little bit before I move on to archaeological sources, to understand the importance of Mahavanshe, uh, there are there are interpretations of Mahavanshe as well, right? Like sometimes when you read Mahavanshe, which is written in Pali, you don't understand anything, okay? But when you read the interpretation of that, uh, which we call the annotation, okay? In Singhala, we call it Vansatappa Kasini. That is to basically analyze and um, describe what's there in Mahavanshe in detail for those who can't understand. Okay, so certain events are described in detail in one sort of Pakasi. That is the annotation or interpretation of Mahavanshya. Okay, one sort of Pakasi. That word is also important to remember. Right. When it comes to archaeological sources, archaeological sources are we have four types of archaeological sources to study history in Sri Lanka. Okay, we can categorize them into four. The first one is. <clears throat> Epigraphy. Sorry. E. The second type of archaeological sources is coins. Third one is ruins. Fourth one is. One second, today. Can you all see my video? Can I see some hands? You all can see my video, right? Okay. I just minimized the video. That's all. <clears throat> okay, the fourth archaeological source is <clears throat> called drawings, sculpture, or statues, and antiquities. So, literally, there are four types of archaeological sources we have from the past which can give a lot of information about history in this country. Okay. So, literary sources means with the writings on books like chronicles, like Buddhist religious texts. We have, uh, we have uh, what uh, uh, we have Prashastika, we have Sandeshaka, we have poems like kind of stuff. And we have foreign sources like maps and books and personal accounts and experiences, stuff like that, right? Epigraphy means with the writings on different types of surfaces other than books. Okay, so let me expand epigraphy here. Just like that. Okay, so epigraphy bute writings other than books on different types of surfaces. That's called epigraphy. So we have writings on stones, right? They are called inscriptions. Part of epigraphy, a media of epigraphy as we call it. Okay, and we have stuff written on wood. We have stuff written on golden plates. Or copper plates, golden plates. We have stuff written on clay slabs. We have stuff written on walls. We have stuff written on wood. We have stuff written on clay. Okay. We can find stuff written on many type of surfaces. They all fall under a category called epigraphy. Okay. And inscriptions means writings on stones. That is only one type of epigraphy. And there's more into epigraphy. Okay. Like copper plates. So inscriptions. We have five types of inscriptions. Based on the size and the shape and the use of the stone. We can categorize inscriptions into five categories. Okay. One is called the rock inscription. I will come on the size base. Your rocks are the biggest type of stones that you can find, right? Rock inscriptions. They are called Girilipi. Okay. Uh, then we have the cave inscription. Cave is the second biggest inscription that we can find. Cave inscriptions. Then we have the pillar inscription. So slab also is also okay, right? So pillars are also big. No, but they, so pillar inscriptions. Pillars, arranged stone pillars were used to write uh, out of stone. We have the slab inscriptions. Huge stone slabs were used to write inscriptions. And we have the seat inscriptions. 
seat shaped uh, inscriptions were written so that people can kneel down and read. Okay. So those are the five types of inscriptions. You have to learn the singular words also for these inscriptions. Okay. Rock inscription is Giri Lipi. Inscription means Lipi. So inscriptions in singular, we call it Sel Lipi. Okay. Sel Lipi. Sel means Shila. It's coming from the word Shila. Shila means with a stone. Okay. So Sel Lipi. Inscriptions are Sel Lipi. Bute. Rock inscriptions are Giri Lipi. Rock is Giri. Cave inscriptions are Len Lipi. Lena means cave. Pillar inscriptions are Tam Lipi. Tam means pillars. <clears throat> slab inscriptions are Puru Lipi. Puru means slabs or boards. Seat inscriptions are Asana Lipi. Asana means chairs or seats. Okay. So you have to remember these five types of inscriptions. Probably with a few examples for that. One very popular example for a pillar inscription, for example, is the Soroborovava inscription or the Badulla inscription. That's a pillar inscription. A very popular example for a slab inscription is Nishankamala's Galpota inscription, okay, in Polonaru period. So you have to remember those kind of things as well, okay. When it comes to copper plates, the Panakadu copper plate done by King Vijaybau the first is the most important copper plate we have in our history. When it comes to the golden plates, we have the Vallipuram golden plate done by King Vasabha uh, during his time, uh, which mentions uh, things like the tax collection system and also appointing of uh, Minister Rishigiri to rule Jaffna, King, uh, Jaffna area. You know, And walls, we have the mirror wall in Sigiri. We have a lot of writings there. Would we have Ambake Dewale? Uh, we can go to Kandy and see Ambake Dewale. In Kandy, we, has, we have we can see a lot of writings on wood there. And clay, there are many places where you can find clay inscriptions or writings on clay. Okay, where roof tiles and floor tiles or whatever. Right. Okay. Right. So that's about epigraphy. Coins, Bude. We have look. We have uh, gold coins, silver coins, and copper coins mainly. So the oldest coins in Sri Lanka uh, were called. Uh, uh, there were Indian coins as well, like Hasebu coins and uh, Lakshmi coins. Uh, swastika coins were also there. Swastika coins is the Hitler's, you know, na the Nazi symbol. Uh, that is swastika symbol. Okay. This is, uh, this is a very old symbol, right? Uh, this doesn't belong to Hitler actually, but unfortunately Hitler used this for his propaganda, right? But swastika symbol is a very old symbol. So if the coin contains this symbol, we call it the swastika coin. If the coin contains the image of uh, Lakshmi, we call it the Lakshmi coins. Or oh, Hasebu coins is basically the uh, elephant coins, okay? Then we have the Kahavanu or Kahapana as we call it. Kahapana or Kahavanu, the gold coins which were manufactured in Sri Lanka. Sometimes they were called Purana or Dharana. Okay. Purana or Dharana. When it comes to ruins, we have a lot of ruins. You go to Anuradhapura, go to Polonnaruva, go to Yapahu, you see a lot of ruins, basically, which helps us understand the architecture, the creative ability, technology. We can learn so many things by studying ruins. Not only the palaces or buildings that we are talking about or the temples, but we can also talk about the ruins of tanks and other constructions like dams. Okay. Everything gives us a lot of information to study history. That is why ruins is one of the archaeological sources here. When it comes to drawings, cultures, and antiquities, drawings, we can see some of the best drawings in our history. If you go to Sigiri, the frescoes of Sigiri, a, a prime example, right? Then for sculpture, we, we have a lot of statues. Unfortunately, everything is not mentioned in your syllabus. You go to Polonnaru, go to Anuradhapur, somewhere in between also, you have a lot of statues. You go to Galvihara in Polonnaru, you have beautiful statues. Aukana statue, Samadhi statue, uh, the statue of Bhatikabe in Ruan Valley Saya premises, Galvihara statue. All those things are not mentioned in your syllabus, unfortunately. But the only prime example for a statue is mentioned in the form of the uh, statue in Isurumunia temple, I can see in Anuradhapur. Go to page number seven in your textbook. You see this photo, the head of the horse and the man's uh, picture or the sculpture or statue. Yeah, uh, you can study that as well.
when it comes to antiquities antiquities means with the stuff that were used by people in the past right uh, they can be beds they can be weapons they can be chairs they can be tools it can be anything right which are very old and we can learn about their lifestyle you can learn so many things in the process okay so those are the two types of literary sources here everything is summarized here other than that you have to learn the importance of learning history uh benefits of learning history and uh, let me just you know give you a general idea about that before we move on to the next lesson okay benefits of learning history uh, facts to consider while using literary sources and uh, users of literary sources what can you do by using literary sources so this is what you need to learn these areas are in the book okay highlighted like uh, highlighted in the sense under numbers or under bullet points you have to take notes on those uh, before the exam because they can be written questions in your exam okay so that's about the first lesson if you have any questions please ask quickly you can drop a chat okay right these three areas you must learn today right uh, i will put the numbers here so right so you can take a screenshot and share in the group right yes with it okay take a screenshot of this now please yeah wait huh? wait one second One second, okay. Yes, please take it now. I don't have space here to write chronicles, uh, religious texts. Uh, we have uh, Sandesha Kavis, Prashasti Kavis. You can do that, okay? One uh, guy, please uh, post in the group. Okay? The next one, learn these areas before you go to the exam, okay? right second lesson at a glance okay second lesson today is about ancient settlements in sri lanka okay now if you draw a timeline of sri lanka if you draw a li the life of sri lanka right this is today 2023 right and this is 1000 to uh, 125000 years ago so we have evidence that first life or the first 
man who came to Sri Lanka would have come around 125,000 years ago. Okay. And then gradually what he did when he came, he settled in uh, places like uh, in, in Iranamadu formation, basically, you know, Iranamadu formation means there is a special type of gravel layer that we can find in the semi-arid zone in Sri Lanka. When the scientists, that gravel layer is very deep under the ground. When the scientists dig that gravel layer and did experiments on that gravel layer, they found traces that can be 125,000 years old and they contain uh, traces of stone tools used by those people and also the bones or skeleton traces of those bones and stuff, which are 125,000 years old. That is how we came to a conclusion that people have stayed here more than 125,000 years ago. And those people were called Homo sapiens. Okay. Homo sapiens. Right. Now, uh, 125,000 years ago, people didn't know how to write. Okay. Because we, we can't find any book that is written 125,000 years ago. Right. So people of Sri Lanka only learned how to write around 2,500 2, years ago. Okay. 2,500 years ago. This is more than calling it 2023. We call it the present. Okay. Better to do that. Right. Okay. So <clears throat> this is the present. Now, 2,500 days ago, people started writing. That is why we always say we have a history of 2,500 days. In all TV channels, you might have heard this. That means the people of Sri Lanka started writing around 2,500 days ago. When they started writing, they wrote many things. They wrote uh, different or various events that took place in the society, day-to-day -day activities and stuff like that. Okay, Who ruled the country and so on. And the written past, uh, the written past, this is about Sri Lanka I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the world history here. I'm talking about Sri Lankan history. The written past, we call it history. If it is written, we call it history. If it is not written, or the time period before this, or before 2,500 years ago, we call it the prehistory. Okay, the prehistory. Now, people came to Sri Lanka around 125,000 years ago. They didn't know how to write, but they knew how to use fire and stuff. They continued to live. They hunted animals and they gathered food to eat and they lived a nomadic life, going from place to place. Nomadic life means with a wandering from place to place. Okay, there's no permanent place. That's what we call a nomadic life or nomadic lifestyle. So they hunted animals like porcupine, uh, deer, samba deer, uh, wild boar, these kind of animals. They gathered food like wild bed fruit, uh, wild plantains. Uh, they preferred eating, uh, you know, snails, tree snails and oysters. They knew how to use salt. Okay. And then they also came to the coastal areas to find salt. Not only that, they also caught freshwater fish out of these water ponds and uh, rivers and stuff. Right. And they lived that life, which is a nomadic life. Okay. They knew how to cook food because we found evidence of wild uh, breadfruit which were baked uh, from places like Kitulgala Belilena. Okay. Right. Now, this is the lifestyle prehistoric men lived. They lived in groups. They used stone tools. Okay. So I'm just writing everything here. You can just, you know, uh, make the notes, right? Stone tools. They were using stone tools, lived in groups, used salt. Loved snails like our girls and oysters. Our girls love eating snails, right? Isn't it? No? All right. So uh, stone tool. See everything at a glance, okay? And evidence for these places, evidence for their uh, places of living uh, can be found in Bundala. 
Opati Rajavela. Uh, we can see places in Pahiangala, in Bulat Singhala, uh, Kuruita, Batadombalena, uh, Kitulgala, Belilena, Minihagal Kand, Minihagal Kand in uh, the southern district, Hambantara. Ambandura district, okay. Uh, Miniha Galkand, then we see uh, Badulla Bandaravela. We see in Sigiri Aligala Potana. Aligala O Potana in Sigiri, okay. We have evidence in these areas, Pute, for prehistoric map, right? And one simple thing that you need to remember prehistoric man of Sri Lanka didn't know how to build houses. He didn't have a permanent place to live and he was living a hunting and gathering type of lifestyle, which is called a nomadic lifestyle. During the dry season, he lived outside. Lived outside. During the wet season, he lived in natural caves. Okay. And this prehistoric era is extremely cold in terms of geographical conditions or climatic conditions. This prehistoric era is extremely cold. Okay. And towards the end of prehistoric era, we will come here. Somewhere here. That is 10,000 years ago, let's say. Okay. Don't uh, worry about the proportions. Okay, this is not a graph lesson. So I'm not, you know, drawing everything in an increment style. Okay, so just, you know, guess this, right? Around 10,000 years ago, this cold climate started changing. Okay, so the cold climate that existed before 10,000 years ago, this part, we call it the Pleistocene era. Pleistocene era. And when the cold climate started changing to a warmer climate, Towards the end of prehistoric era. Now, this is the end of prehistoric era, right? This is the end of prehistoric era. This is the beginning of historic era, okay? So, towards the end of prehistoric era, the climate started changing to a warmer one. When the climate started becoming warmer and warmer, it was like a blessing for agriculture. So, people of prehistoric era changed their lifestyle and started doing agriculture. They were thinking, they may, maybe they were thinking like, why hunt when you can grow? Okay, because the climate is helpful now. You can grow with this, you know, mild, warm climate. Right? And then uh, they started building houses. One second, okay. You can draw nice pictures, all right? This is a cold climate, the warm climate. Towards this, right? Okay. Uh, so uh, they started building houses. They got the technology to build houses. Uh, they uh, found how to build, how to make clay pots. Uh, they found how to leach iron out of minerals like limonite and hematite, for example, and make tools out of iron like memories and later on weapons and stuff like that, tools, knives and so on. And uh, their lifestyle started changing and they, they became a bit advanced. And that period where a lot of changes that happened in the lifestyle of human beings in Sri Lanka is called the proto historic era. Protohistoric era or protohistoric period. Okay. So towards the end of the historical period, towards the end of the history, uh, sorry, towards the end of the prehistoric period and towards the beginning of the historical period, we have this transformational period where a lot of changes in people's lifestyle took place uh, is called the protohistoric era. Okay. So agriculture started. started to build houses
used iron and clay uh, yes usage of iron and clay agriculture animal husbandry also includes there right okay and also used the uh, systematic or proper burial tradition i will come to that okay right so udarancha madam udarancha madam or ancha madam udarancha madam both are okay is a very good example of uh, very good uh, evidence site that we have found so far uh, with regards to the lifestyle of protohistoric man we found a house in udarancha madam we also found a cemetery in udarancha uh, madam udarancha madam so we have a lot of evidence related to protohistoric man over there okay right now uh, when it comes to the burial tradition okay when it comes to the ritual the prehistoric man used a random burial tradition or not a systematic burial tradition what the prehistoric man did when somebody died they dug a pit inside the cave buried the dead body covered it with rubbish like garbage okay then they after some time they allowed the body to decay and they unearthed the skeleton of the body sometimes they polished the skeleton and buried it back this is not a proper burial tradition but when it comes to the proto history era we can see people following a proper burial tradition like the cist burials okay cist burials means to the four stone splinters are arranged in a square shape human remains in clay pots are buried inside and a huge stone slab is used to cover that that is called a cist burial okay stone splinters are arranged in a coffin shape human remains are put inside and, the, and a big stone slab is used to cover that cist burials then we have urn burials urn burials means with a huge clay vessels are deposited with human remains and the huge clay vessel is buried under the ground that is called urn burials and we have had the clay tub burials clay tub burials means with a a boat shaped tub is made out of clay and the dead body is kept inside and then the dead body is cremated when the dead body is cremated or set fire to the dead body uh, the resulting process out of burning basically bakes or cooks the whole clay tub and makes it very very hard and strong that is why you see these clay tubs in udarancha madam even after 3000 years today right so that is how we found those evidence okay so that's the systematic burial tradition that was followed by the proto historic man and this burial tradition is called the megalithic burial tradition that is called the big stone megalithic mega means big lith uh, mega means big lithic means big, uh, stone okay so big stone tradition i mean big so huge stone splinters are used to build these tombs uh, the, uh, the best example for that is cist burials okay right when it comes to the historical period pute now during the proto historic era see during the prehistoric era people didn't have permanent settlements during the proto historic era they started agriculture and they started building houses permanent settlements and during the historic era the first few hundred years we call it the early historic era okay during the early historic era these settlements started expanding the settlement started expanding to other areas in the country for example we have evidence near kirindi oya kirindi oya is a very popular oya next to manikganga in the southern province those who came to our seminar a map marking seminar knows how to mark this place those who didn't come to the map marking seminar if you need the recording please ask me okay right those who didn't come to the map marking seminar so around kirindi oya we see these settlements expanding in the early historic time first of all these settlements were away from the river okay they are very isolated right then the, gradually the settlement started coming towards the river you know why first they like to stay out of the river because during the rainy season the river floods and you die sometimes your your crops will die and you might also die so very dangerous so gradually these people of the early history era mastered the technology of managing water by building tanks for example so they built tanks to save water sometimes 
the extra water from the rivers are diverted to the tanks. And now they also knew how to control floods by building big tanks. So they gradually started moving towards the river because you like, you, everybody loved to live near the river. Why? Not because of the sceneries or tourism, but because the soil near the river or soil to, uh, close to the banks of the river are very moist, wet and fertile, Okay, very rich. So whatever you grow, it will grow quickly. That's why people love to stay near the river. Earlier, they didn't love this because they didn't know how to manage the floods. But later on, they recognized they found ways to manage the floods and then they started gradually moving towards the river. So this is what happened in the early history of Kera. In the early history of Kera, uh, villagers were born. Okay, I'm, I'm putting a note here. Okay, Villagers were born. Uh, settlements started expanding. Okay, one second. Villages were villages were uh, built. We can say built. Okay, villages were built and they had tanks. And uh, literally every village had a tank. Uh, if there was a tank in a village, we call them Vapi Gum. Vapi means the old name to call a tank. Vaukilakyan, it's a little modern name. Vapi means very old. Villages were built and had tanks. And uh, dif uh, different types of professionals lived in those villages. Okay. For example, Kasikara Gama, farmers' villages. So people started separating into jobs or professions and uh, started living in different villages. Kevattagama, fishermen's villages. Fishermen's village. Uh, Gopalagama, cowherd's village. Kumbhakaragama, uh, the um, potter's village, those who made pots. Vattatigama, Vaduagilakana, Vattatigama, the carpenter's village. Manikaragama, the gem miner's village. So we had different types of villages, okay? And not only that, that is based on the professionals who lived in the village. So they were separated, okay? And we also had another type of village based on the tasks. Some villages were near harbors, okay? Some villages were near harbors, which supplied stuff that are required by harbors to operate. For example, accommodation facilities, we can say uh, storage facilities, uh, were shipping facilities for different religion. So they are called Pattanagam. Okay. So Pattana means with the Pattanagam means with the, the villagers close to harbors or ports. Right. That is a that is the function of that village. Okay. Not based out of those who lived in that village. Okay. Then there are other villages called Niamgam. Niamgam means with the intermediate villages that were doing trading or business. Okay. One village people will bring products to sell. Another village people will be coming to buy those products. So Niamgam was like a market village, okay, like a trading village. Okay. So those are a few names to remember when it comes to the ancient society of Sri Lanka and uh, the distribution of villages and the expansion of villages. Okay. So a few stuff, uh, important stuff is discussed here. Uh, and uh, and uh, the important points would be, remember these points, okay? One second, I will line them up, okay? Uh, climate zones in Sri Lanka. Climate zone, what is semi-arid zone? What is the wet zone? Uh, you have to remember that what is the dry zone? You have to remember a few climate zones in Sri Lanka and the types of villages based on professionals. Based on tasks.
there are more than what I uh, just typed here, but just go to the book and revise these sections before you go to the exam. Okay, so that's it about lesson number two. All the important stuff are covered. And can you take a screenshot now, please? Oops, one second, one second, one second. One second, Bhutan. Okay, please take note. Yes, with the Olagam, yeah, Olagam is also uh, uh, basically they are deserted villages near tanks. Okay, so some uh, some uh, villages are deserted, uh, basically you know due to different reasons. Okay, due to uh, uh, expansion of those tanks. Or due to no people, no enough people to live uh, in those areas, or the village itself being converted to another tank, right? Sometimes the tanks are expanding, and the uh, uh, sometimes you know when the tank is full, the village is also like uh, you know gets flooded. So that village is deserted because of that. Okay, so they are called olagam. Okay. Yes, Pude. Yeah, I can show you the other one. Here's the other note. Please post it in the group. Yeah. Okay, with it. So uh, we'll go for a five. Uh, we'll go for a short break. Okay, you guys can take the notes. You guys can also just you know have a small glimpse on the book actually um and we will start lesson number three three four five in the next leg and we will finish it off okay lesson number three four five and we will skip a few lessons uh planning to discuss all the lessons but um like only very important stuff will be discussed in a few lessons uh but 18 more than 18 slides hopefully yeah okay so that is what our plan for tonight um yeah okay we'll see you in 10 minutes yes